Hello, everybody. Um, so a big welcome to all of you in the UK and those joining from around the world uh, for our latest uh, edition of the Safe and Care Group webinars. How safe and how anonymized is anonymized? And this stemmed uh, from a newspaper article uh, a couple of weeks ago when we heard that the government planned on uh, selling UK residents uh, private medical uh, data to private um, American firms. So um, there was a lot of pressure, uh, Ferrari and a uh, lot of pressure groups on the government. Um, and the date to opt out uh, for citizens to opt out was meant to be today. And that's been pushed forward for a couple of months. But we decided to put a webinar together with a number of experts from both medical and technical backgrounds to discuss this topic. So I'd like to hand you over to our chairman, uh, who, uh, Professor Stafford Lightman, to take over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And welcome to everybody for to tonight's webinar. I think the most amazing thing about tonight's webinar is that the subject seems to to most of the population to have suddenly arrived out of thin air with the surprising revelation of a planned NHS data sharing program for which there seems to be little or no consultation. Data is becoming one of the most valuable resources both for valuable social improvement but also for commercial use. Uh, we're all becoming increasingly aware of the scope of data and commerce as, a, as everything we seem to buy results in multiple unwanted advertisements on our internet. This can be very annoying, but it's relatively benign. However, what about more personal details of our health and our social situations? I just want you know, are people aware that NHSX is already costing us one billion pounds a year for setting a national policy for NHS technology, digital and data, including data sharing and transparency? So, you know, we need to know, do we have control of our data and should other organizations be able to access them for their own purposes? Uh, Era Darzi and James O'Shaughnessy have summarized admirably three principles that are essential, essential if we're going to use NHS data for the good of our population. The first is that patients must feel a sense of agency and control over what happens to their data. Secondly, health data must always be used in a way that is safe, secure, legal and ethical. And finally, there must be a concerted effort to fairly distribute the benefits of this data to people right across the UK. Now, tonight's expert panel be, will be looking at these principles and the degree to which taxpayers get value from the use of their medical records, its availability to others, the question of whether anonymity really exists, and how the potential availability of data to third parties may affect patients' trust in the NHS and what they're prepared to discuss or disclose with their GPs. So to open this tonight, we, we are fortunate to have Sarah Scobie, who's the Deputy Director of Research at the Nuffield Trust, who's going to discuss what we can and what we should do with patient data. Sarah. Thanks very much, Stafford, and um, thanks very much for inviting me along today. Um, so Stafford indicated I work for the Nuffield Trust which is an independent health think tank, and we aim to improve the quality of care in the UK by providing evidence-based research and analysis and informing and generating debate. Um, now, just to start with a little background about myself. So I've worked with health data for most of my working life since my first job in the NHS, which is in 1985. Um, my main areas of interest are in quality of care. And so the topic of health data is hugely important to me. And I think that how we can use data to improve the quality of health services has never been more important than it is today. Um, and I think there's also huge, even greater opportunities um, at the moment than there have been, have been in the past. So I'm hoping to give you a little bit of context in terms of how the NHS uses data um, and how important it is, because I think that's really essential to understanding wider uses of, of data and understanding that context around how data, how important data is in the NHS. So I think it's useful to think about three broad areas 
where data can be used and should be used for public benefit. Um, and I think that we can think about these in terms of what uh, the public might reasonably expect their, their data to be used for. So as a patient, I expect the people who care for me to have access to my medical history. And I want them to be using information that's specific to me, that's personal to me. I, I, I want them to have my personal data because I want them to use that to identify the best treatment and care options. As a taxpayer, there's quite a few things actually that I want to know. I want to know that the organisations that are funded to deliver services are held accountable and that the government ensures there's good value for money. I also want to know that the government's being held to account for its health policies and um, that it's, it's delivering on, on promises made to us. Um, and then of course, I want to know that the fundamental values of the NHS that it's delivered based on need, for example, are also addressed. So things like inequalities and so on. And then as a, as a citizen more generally, um, I want to know that researchers can use data to uh, identify new treatments and better ways to deliver services effectively. And it may be that I'm not going to benefit from these personally, but it, it's important to me that there are these benefits to wider society and, and to future generations. And to give some sort of more specific examples in these areas um, that have often been happening you know, prior to the pandemic and, and for a number of years. So in terms of the direct care to patients, um, in many areas now, uh, A&E doctors and hospital pharmacists, for example, can access the data that's in the, in the medical record of their, of their GP. Um, and that can help with their treatment in terms of the medication that they get and, and the decisions about their care. Um, and a slightly wider example of that is the use of data to identify people at risk of particular conditions and how that can then inform their future health needs in terms of the follow-up that they need or the likelihood that they're going to um, need extra care and support. I think as a taxpayer, um, we can see that data is used across the NHS for managing services, so for planning capacity, making funding decisions, monitoring quality of care and performance, you know, spotting trends in health needs. And, and without data, our approach to some of these problems like allocating resources would really be complete guesswork. Um, so uh, um, data is really critical and, and it's critical in evaluating health policies, for example. So whether the policy around patient choice really made any difference to the quality of care or, or waiting times. And then the NHS partners with companies to, to um, who develop drugs and medical treatments to enable them to test those out and, and data is critical to that. Um, and I, it's kind of obvious, but it, it's worth remembering that the NHS doesn't manufacture its own drugs or, or um, equipment, you know, scanners, whatever, any more than it, it manufactures its own beds. So it relies on commercial organisations for those, for those developments and, and, and that involves the use of data with those organisations. So um, I think with COVID, we've seen uh, an acceleration in how data has been used. I think the combination of the urgency of addressing the challenges facing the health system, um, the lack of information at the beginning about COVID itself, and um, at occurring also at a time when there have been huge developments in data science and, te and technology that have really helped, helped better use of data. So uh, we've had have some great examples from there. Some of them you probably heard of. So um, for example, the shielded patient list was developed based on, on data from um, primary care and from hospital records. Uh, we've really seen that the vaccination program has been able to use data effectively to um, target uh, and prioritize to identify populations where particular types of vaccination work is needed. So pop-up vaccination centers, mobile units and so on. Um, and then there's the drug uh, trials such as the recovery trial, which again, again have used data for medical records. Um, there's a couple of things that we've specifically been involved with at the Nafiel Trust. So one of them has been the analysis of um, outpatient data. So looking at the shift to uh, appointments being undertaken remotely. Um, and to understanding which specialties that's happened, um, 
the, and how quickly services have returned back to face to face or not. Um, in a, and that's going to be really important for understanding future future service delivery. And we're also part of a team that's evaluating the COVID virtual wards and COVID oximetry at home um, initiatives. And, and the findings of these, I think, are going to be really important, not just for COVID patients, but for managing other conditions outside of hospital as well. And none of this would be possible without using data from health records. So sort of looking forward now, I think that it's critical to me that we keep up the momentum in using health data that's been developed during COVID um, to enable us to address some of the big challenges facing health and care. At the moment, we have really a pretty toxic mix of a backlog of people waiting for planned care, the ongoing impacts of COVID, for example, long COVID, the vaccination programme still going on, um, increases in hospital cases at the moment, along with overstretched staff and capacity constraints due to social distancing. So there really is an urgency to use data effectively to plan and prioritise treatment um, and to understand where resources need to be um, and which services, for example, could be delivered digitally and which can't and to who, um, as well as to track the needs of people who have had COVID and what their future um, use of health services and, and what kinds of services are going to need to be developed to support them. At the, at the moment, we really know very little about the impact of COVID on health and, and what treatments are going to be effective. And, and I know you've had a, had a webinar on this in the past. Um, so that having been said, uh, there is still a lot to do to extend the use of data, in my view. Um, so I would particularly highlight, in fact, improving the quality of data and the sharing of data from outside hospital care um, in health and from social care. So I think the lack of data about uh, primary care in many ways um, and social care certainly distorts some of our understanding and I think can lead us to focus on, on hospital services. Um, and so this is going to require better data from these settings and, and the ability to link data from, from different sources. And there are different ways to link data and I suspect we might come on and discuss some of these later on um, in the webinar. I think one other area just to highlight is the need to invest in the analytic workforce in the NHS. So I think the pandemic has seen a growing realisation of the importance of, of analysis roles, but there's a lot more to do to recognise the value and, and to value that those roles accordingly and, and raise expectations among clinici clinicians and managers about um, the importance of being data driven in, in our decision making. But to, to sum up for now, I, I think for me, the main point I want to get across is that much of what we do in the health service would just not be possible without the data that we built up from individual patient records. And, and while there are challenges, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, you know, over time, hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved by treatments that we've identified from the analysis of health data, and that the NHS has become more efficient and is using public money more effectively um, through the use of data that we have one of the most refined resource allocation policies in the world as a result of data. So, so for me, I think uh, we should be doing more with data would be my pitch. Thank you. Sarah, thank, thank you very much indeed. C can I just ask you some factual bits that I just can't quite get my head around? You, you stress the fact that clearly we need to invest more uh, in data and data management. Uh, what I'm not clear about is the use of data that we have already. Uh, has it been the NHS that has been dealing with these data? Has it been academic units? Has it been uh, private organizations? Who, who's been actually dealing with the data that we have so far? So uh, the data that we have so far um, is used by the NHS. Um, it's accessible to researchers. So for example, um, we use data on um, hospital activity that we get from the Nuffield Trust. To get hold of that data, we have to go through quite a lengthy process 
to request the data, to explain the reasons why we're going to use it, what we're going to use it for, to demonstrate the public benefit, to demonstrate the environment that we're going to use the data in, um, and, uh, and we have to report back to NHS Digital about, about the benefits, about public benefits from the use of the data. Um, other organisations um, can also apply to use um, to use data, so a lot of research organisations can, um, but so can um, commercial organisations, but they will also need to establish the public benefit and the security and the safety and so on of the data. So what, what's so different about what was being planned by uh, giving or selling all of this data to a private company? Is it very different from what we do already? Well, I, I think that interpretation of the situation is a very, very narrow one. Um, I think that what's, um, uh, for some time, data has flowed from primary care information systems to NHS Digital, um, but it's been for specific purposes. Um, with the COVID um, pandemic, a, a, a flow of data was established that um, included a wide range of codes from across the patient's medical record. Um, so uh, simply because of the very wide range of, of things that we know might be related to COVID. Um, uh, so, so, those, so these types of flows have been happening for some time and what is proposed as, as I understand it um, is that those flows would be for the same purposes for public benefit um, and that the same kind of uh, controls around who can access the data would also be in place as has previously been in place. Um, so to me, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a fundamentally different thing. It, it is, and there is a change, I think, in, in the scope of the data in that it's not specific to COVID, um, but the COVID data set was quite wide ranging. Um, I think the other thing to bear in mind is that what's happened often in the past is that lots of people people, lots of organizations have gone individually to practices to request data. So as well as what I've just been talking about, which was flows to NHS Digital, there's also um, uh, uh, organizations um, such as CPRD that collect data from a sample of practices and then that data they do um, sell on, you have to pay quite a hefty license fee to get access to that data. Um, and then there might be uh, local data flows for particular shared record schemes or particular types of analysis. So for a lot of practices, they've been um, responding to a number of different data flows. And one of the, uh, of the rationale behind, as, as I understand it, um, is is that actually this would simplify some of those flows by uh, meaning that there weren't so many different flows of data from, from primary care. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to this in the general discussion, but that was a very helpful way for opening this webinar. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, a very sticky wicket, which is basically uh, about uh, anonymity uh, and uh, we're going to the, our next speaker is Terry Hook, who's the CEO for Caretech Medical Business and the operations, uh, uh, the operations director uh, for Sleep and Health Clinic and a non-executive director of Ajima Radio, which is uh, based in Bristol. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about data availability, security and control. So, Terry. Thank you, Sam. Please. Yeah, no, I mean, as, as we uh, probably mentioned before, it's a subject I could probably go on for, for many hours, but we'll, we'll try and keep it succinct. Thank you. Um, but also, just to give you a little history of, of, of myself, um, I've been in, involved in systems implementation, 
uh, since about 1983, um, and whether it's been the medical fraternity or the uh, financial uh, landscape. Um, so I helped put in the original uh, trading systems. So I've got a fairly good handle on um, what, what data flows occur, when they occur, how they occur, um, but also importantly, um, what is available to people legally and also illegally. Um, and that goes back to the security and control. One of the things I would say um, from, from a standpoint is that the, the horse has already bolted um, and that people's data in all sorts of formats is already out there. Um, and really, it'll come back to something that, again, we can discuss later, but it comes back down to the individual's responsibility now to ensure that their, their data is either safe um, or not misused in a way that they don't want it to be, to be used. Um, I mean, going back to the availability, um, people talk about anonymized data. Um, in my uh, experience, there's no such thing as anonymized data. There might be pseudo anonymized data, but the moment you have uh, three or four markers of data, it's normally not a big job to actually identify individuals, especially medical data. And an example I can give you is a particular hospital put out um, uh, data for research around um, uh, pregnancy. Um, and within a fairly short time, the team were able to identify every person within their database, even though it had been stripped of all the personal information. Um, so we should go away from this thought process that any data is anonymized. It's not. Um, and it's not just within a data set. You can put different data sets from different areas. And the example that, that I've seen in the past is uh, in America, where they've put together um, uh, tax records on one hand uh, without the names. Um, and addresses, but, the, but have the general area. And then they've also put that together with the uh, uh, mobile uh, phone records, uh, again, without all of the data, but a were able to identify taxi drivers who were basically not reporting all their income. Um, so the point with that is that, is that, that you, know, you can have anonymized data from two different sources, three different sources, four different sources and you can identify people. The, the, the other point about this is, is that please do not ever think that um, your data is not valuable. Um, if you take the present situation, there are companies, um, probably not in the UK, who earn their livings by creating profiles on us as individuals. And by that, I mean, they will try and uh, break into your Tesco uh, club card, your bank. Um, they will look you up on the credit reference uh, sites because they're free. They will put together your information. Um, and I would include medical information on this and I'll help put it in perspective in, in terms of value in, in a few seconds. Um, but they actually operate on the basis that they provide your information to criminals and only do a sale on upon return, that type of thing. As in, if the criminal makes money out of you, they get paid. If the criminal doesn't make any money out of you, they don't pay anything. So they have sophisticated um, payment models, let alone uh, actually getting the data. Um, to give you an idea, if you go on the black market um, and ask for somebody's credit card details, that might cost you about 90 cents. Um, if you ask for their medical data, um, you could probably pay at about $25. So medical data is much more valuable uh, than just the financial data. So this comes back to security. Um, everybody reads about hacking um, and, and 
sees it in the newspapers, but very few people kind of really understand what it means until it affects them personally. Um, and there are at least two people on this call that I know have been affected by this. But let me tell you the different levels. There are countless, countless um, um, occasions and lists as well of corporations being or entities, including the NHS, um, being hacked into for their data um, or held to ransom, all sorts of things. The point with that is that most of that time, um, the hacking occurs or the illegal entry occurs from an infrastructure level. However, there are two other levels which tend to, to, to uh, also be quite active. Um, the first is apps or applications um, and, and uh, if you like, um, gangs will, will break in via that, that, that route, but also individuals. So, and I go back to this particular one, um, once a, um, a gang have worked out what your password is and all that sort of thing, they can get into your email accounts and uh, change the rules. So for instance, so they can then have a complete conversation either with your doctor or your bank manager uh, and you know nothing about it. And as far as the other person at the other end is concerned, they are talking to you. So the consequences of that can be quite huge. Um, by the way, on, on both the parts that, that once people know your medical history, um, they can actually hold you to ransom personally. Um, and financially, they can uh, convince banks to transfer money to places it, it shouldn't go. So what does this come down to? Well, the availability of data is, is, is more or less absolute. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that the government might be giving away um, our data to um, a, a country outside of the UK um, probably makes it less secure than if it was in the UK. Um, however, um, there's no, not a 100% guarantee that either way. The fact uh, that, that we lose control of our data, um, you just have to take a different stance. So you will see everything from your banks telling you to change your passwords regularly, or even Microsoft now might force you after a period to change it. These are all good habits to get into, um, but also things that, that, that are, are unseen. Things like, um, you know, the credit reference agencies have a lot of data about your financial transactions. So, you know, and that's not something that you've probably purposely thought about and or given. However, you've given it because you've signed a, a loan agreement of some kind or a credit card, et cetera, um, and therefore given the right for these other companies that you're not dealing with directly to actually have your information. Um, and I would put the same in, in, in the sense of, of medical information. Uh, really, it should be your data in your control um, and not uh, the state um, as we have it with the, the NHS. It should be down to the individuals. Um, and I think the announcement that has occurred hasn't given enough consultation, if you like, with the public. Um, and certainly there's not enough time for people to actually digest the information and then make a choice. Um, personally, I always go work on the basis that uh, I give no permission for my data. And then um, if somebody needs it or an application needs it, and it's to my advantage, then I'll give it. But don't do it the other way around. Stafford, has that worried you enough? <laughs> Terry, this is—I mean, this is obviously a terrifying scenario that you've painted. But what we seem to be caught on the horns of a dilemma here, because clearly it is extremely important to have availability of this data for the development of science and medicine uh, and for a lot of other positive uses, uh, as Sarah mentioned. So 
to have it available is, is extremely important. And you say we must be personally responsible, but presumably all we can do is to say my personal data is or is not available. I mean, how can we say I would like my data to be available for specific things and specific things only? Is, this, is that feasible? Well, with, with the NHS data to, as, as it is today, probably not. Um, but what you have got growing at a very fast rate, and, and, and equally I'm involved in this um, in, 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 in an in a intimate way, um, there are lots of apps that are now um, uh, garnering um, your medical data. And absolutely, with all the GDPR rules, regulations, um, all of these apps actually should be giving a granular level of um, uh, detail that allows you to um, pinpoint individual parts of your data that you allow to, for, go, to, to go for research, as an example, um, or to your doctor, um, as a matter of course. Having said that, um, anybody has the legal right to get that data for legal reasons. So an, uh, a medical emergency would be that, you know, a lawful reason. So, so your doctor could request that information from the app um, and be legally right, right in actually getting it. Um, you as a patient actually don't have a choice about giving it to him because he's making that decision. But generally speaking, um, as we go forward um, with technology, uh, advancing in, in the medical field um, quite dramatically at the moment, I, I would say, no, we've, we've got to think about it and make those individual choices. Uh, and also, is it possible that uh, rather than giving all of this data to another organisation, uh, we could specify that people from that organisation could come and use the data, so not be given uh, all of the uh, personal information they might want so that you know we uh, the NHS could act as the gatekeeper could they do that well they, feas feasibly but I suspect there's a piece of work to be done um, which the government may or may not be willing to pay for um, you know you, you 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 can put all the filters and all the, the gatekeeping um, things in place but then then they operationally need to be manned um, and as well as developed and implemented in the beginning um and as as sarah will probably tell you the you know the, the complexity of the nhs systems um just means that that you you start a project probably at 10 million as a minimum and then work upwards but i mean the government was thinking of selling data for billions Oh, well, in which case, then they should use that money um, wisely. Um, and, and, and again, it goes back to what, what Sarah said before. Um, they need to invest it, I would say, not in just data analyst type people, um, but data security people. Um, you know, you, you, you need to look at the full um, chain, if you like, supply chain of data to from, from its originator which is you or i uh right through to the end use um and you need to understand that um that chain and put all the controls in at various different points so every time there's handed over data uh there is a secure protocol and encryption that occurs so so it's not just the handing over of data or the stream of data but the stream itself whilst being transmitted is encrypted. Um, and, and all of that actually is an expensive infrastructure to put in place. And would that in infrastructure be within individual trusts or would it be some central? Oh, well, now, 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 now you're asking the difference between when Gordon Brown spent the odd 12 billion um, and what the trusts might, might do themselves. Yeah. Um, I, I think Sarah probably knows this as well. One of the things I would say is that um, the, the, the NHS, in either centrally or locally, um, need to pay 
rates that, that attracts the good people um, and, and not the, 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 the people at the lower end of the, the skill levels. Um, you know, because you're talking about very sensitive data that needs a lot of control um, and a lot of things in place. Oh, okay. I'm sure we're going to come back to this uh, in, in the general discussion, but uh, this is it's obviously incredibly complicated. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Terry. So now we're going to go on to somebody at the sharp end of this, which is uh, uh, Rosie Shire. And Rosie is a GP from Warrington, that has been for 11 years. And she's the Doctors Association Lead for General Practice Data for Planning and Research, uh, also known as a DAUK Lead for GDP, GPDPR. And I, Rosie is going to tell us about the concerns from general practice. Rosie. Hi, good evening. Having me here. So I'd like to talk about this from the perspective of a GP. And I think probably the concerns are shared throughout primary care. I didn't know anything about this when it was a, well, it was announced on the 12th of May and I knew absolutely nothing about this. Um, and then I was asked on behalf of DA UK to have a chat with someone about it and give my views on it. And I was skeptical to start with because I don't really care who has my data. Terry's gonna be sh you know, shaking his head now, but you know, I'm like, well, I don't do anything wrong. If somebody wants to know what I buy at Tesco, that's fine. So I'm quite happy with that. And then as I learned more about this, data grab or the GPDPR sharing scheme. I was worried about it. Um, at the moment, as has been said, data does go from GP practices through to the uh, NHS Digital. People request that for a specific reason. And then once the request has been approved, then the data will go. So it's each time it happens, you do have to upload you know, another request for it. So fair enough, that's quite time consuming. What wants to happen now is that all of our data, all of our medical records of everybody in England will be uploaded on the 1st of September. And that's it. If you haven't opted out before the 1st of September, you can't get that back. You can opt out after the 1st of September and then you will be able to stop any further uploads but you can't retract what's already been sent. So why is there a problem with all the medical records going apart from everything that's already been said? As a GP, I'm really worried about what my patients are gonna think about this. Are my patients gonna trust me with their sensitive information if they think that I might be complicit in sending it off to Google or goodness knows where? We know that confidentiality is vital when we're speaking to patients it's it's almost unsaid but sometimes we will clarify and say is there something you want to tell me anything you tell me now is confidential and I'm not going to share that unless I think you're at risk and then the patient might come forward and tell us things such as domestic violence sexually transmitted infections mental health problems all those things are gonna go with this. So it needs to be looked after. We're absolutely not against the idea of this data being used for research purposes, for planning, for funding. It's great, but we just wanna know more about how it's gonna be used, who's gonna have access to it, on what terms are they gonna have access to it, and what the safety nets are to make sure that if somebody is identified, as Terry was saying, that the data is pseudonymized, so it, it can be re-identified. And in certain circumstances, third party companies are allowed to re-identify any pseudonymized data. What are those circumstances? At the moment, we have no information on this. So we're worried that patients are going to not tell us stuff. It's going to affect our consultation. If you think, for example, someone's got a low mood, they're not sleeping, they're, uh, they're maybe putting on a bit of weight, struggling with their bowels. As a GP, I think, okay, what could be causing this? Have a chat about anything else. Do you smoke? Do you drink? Patient tells me, oh, 
maybe a bottle of wine a week. And I'm like, okay, right, well, we need to investigate this. Actually, the truth might be that they drink four bottles of wine a day, but they don't want to tell me that now because they're worried that I'm going to write alcohol misuse or alcoholism or problem with alcohol on their records. And then that's going to be uploaded. And what if someone else finds out? So there's that, that trust that is potentially could be broken between the GP and the patient. And once the trust goes, that's it. You can't do your job and it's going to affect patient care. It's really important that patients can consent to their data being used like this. As medics were taught about informed consent, so someone has to know what they're consenting to, what the procedure is, why they need to have it, what the risks are, what the benefits are, and then they weigh it up and decide. If you're using an opt-out system, then how do people even know about it? If they don't know about it, they can't make give consent because they don't know it's there to start with. I think I see it akin to as if someone's walking down the street and I run up to them and start taking their blood pressure and say, oh, and they said, well, what are you doing? You said, well, you, you didn't tell me you didn't want your blood pressure taken. Well, I didn't know you were going to take it. Well, you know, that's how I see this opt out because it's just not been publicised at all. There's all the people who aren't online, people whose English isn't their first language. They may not be able to understand written English, people with problems, learning disabilities, reading problems. How are they going to find out all about this? So there's a lot of concerns there about trust and consent. There's the issue that this has been dumped on GPs. So GPs aren't getting any funding for this work. And in effect, they've been told they've got to inform their patient population about this process. And they get, they've then got to process these forms and add the correct code to the patient notes. So these forms to opt out, it's not an online thing, which it is for different opt out for medical records for this one it's a form that you have to fill in and either then eat scan in and send back to your GP or take it into your GP practice GPs have then got to take an admin person off answering the phones dealing with patient queries they've got to then scan that form onto the patient records and then make sure that code is added who's going to pay for that there isn't any extra money there general practice is just groaning under the weight of pressure right now really struggling i think we're all seeing that in all the medical news that general practice is struggling and yet we're suddenly supposed to take on this extra work there's a concern as well that because gps have been told to well they've just been told to put it on the website actually so we then go back to what if you're not online but then if somebody says well i didn't know about it they're going to blame the gp they're not going to blame nhs digital they're not going to blame the government so there's that concern as well. And then there's also the concern about what's gonna to happen to things that are developed using this data. So for example, Moorfields Eye Hospital made some data available to a research group and they developed some really good software. Great. But then Moorfields had to pay to buy back that software to help them dealing with their eye patients. So it's not clear. I think, great, if you can develop something that's going to benefit patients, not put them at risk, it's going to improve their care, that's great. But then if the NHS can't afford to buy it or is priced out of the market, that just doesn't seem fair when it's come from our data. So we're not against this at the moment, but we just want more information and we want to make sure that this new process doesn't stop that trusted relationship between the doctor and the patient. I'll unmute myself. I'll unmute. So Rosie, do you, do you feel that you're being made complicit in this? As, as, as if the GPs are actually part of this scheme to use people's data? It feels like it could be that way. We've seen a lot of GP bashing in the press. You know, GPs have been closed. Why, why aren't GPs open? I can't get appointments. A lot of negativity. NHS England hasn't been supporting GPs. They've instead been sending out um, standard operating procedures, SOPs saying you must see patients face to face. So 
you must see children if they're unwell and everyone thinks well yes that's what we do we are um so there's not been a lot of support recently in the media from nhs england and there's a worry that this is just another way to try and blame the gps um and to give more negativity towards us because i mean it's called gp data so you know people it looks like we are the ones sending it actually we're not it's being taken from the systems by the government unless we add the codes to the notes so maybe maybe i can get back to uh, some general discussion i mean sarah uh, if i could get back to sarah uh the you made a very good case for how important all of this all of this data was and uh, i think we can all see how important it is but obviously li listening to rosie it, it puts us in a very difficult situation if the patients uh don't understand the value of the of the value of the data how are we how are we in a position actually to sort of dictate we should make this available I mean, I, 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 it just seems wrong. Yeah, so I think this is really an important point. Um, so there's been quite a lot of research, actually, um, so led by an organisation called Understanding Patient Data that's part of the Wellcome Trust around how patients view data um, and data sharing and how they weigh up the, the balances you know, the risks and benefits of data sharing. Um, and I think uh, in many ways, people underestimate probably how sophisticated people are in their, in their views and in weighing up those risks. Um, I think the really central thing that comes out of some of that research is that, is that there is evidence for public benefit um, and so um, that is, is one of the principles um, that really needs to be at the heart of any data that's, that's shared, that, um, that that is weighed up. I mean, I think it, it gets, it would get very complicated to ask people about sharing data for very specific purposes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to see how that could be feasible, but there is, um, there is quite a lot of evidence about how to communicate with patients um, that I think really should be, should be brought to bear at the moment to, to make sure that this uh, process and this time scale that's now been set is that that time that we now have is, is used most effectively. Um, to, to make sure that some of this is put in place, some of this improved communication and so on. So we've got a question, uh, probably mainly for Rosie to begin with from Michael O'Reilly, who wants to know whether you think that GPs should add the stop code to all of your patient notes until proper agreement and patient consent are provided. Yeah, I've seen that some GPs online have said that that's what they're going to do is they're going to either blank, they're going to blanket opt out all of their patients unless their patients opt in. Again, that's a huge amount of work. We've got 10,000 patients in our practice. I can't even think how long that's going to take to do. Um, what The question that I've asked um, and the Doctors Association UK are working at the moment with Fox Club, who are a tech justice not for profit company. Um, and I've asked this to them is, would it be legal to do that? Because this is a government directive to say, you add the opt out code to your patient notes if they give you this form, otherwise you don't. So if you opt it out to everybody's notes, what does that mean? Is that legal? But equally, if I want to share somebody's medical records, for example, an insurance company sends over a request for a patient's records, I can't just give it to that insurance company and say to the patient, oh, well, you didn't tell me you didn't want it to. Actually, we then have to get a patient consent form and some places will say to the patient, are you sure you want your whole records going or do you just want the bit about the car crash to go? So are we gonna be then breaking the, the, oh my goodness, the Data Protection Act if we do send the full records and the patients say, well, actually, 
I didn't know anything about it. You didn't get my consent to do it. So it feels a little bit like we're stuck between a rock and a hard plate at the moment. But certainly when I find out the answer to if it would be legal to opt out the whole practice, I'll come back and let you know. <laughs> Thanks. We uh, also have a question from Peter Gray, Rosie and others. It's common ground that the individual can regulate what parts of their personal data are disclosed. One's mindful of the scenario when trying to arrange an appointment to see your GP that the receptionist asks regarding the nature of the problem. The receptionist at our surgery actually refused to make an appointment unless she was told the problem, which could, of course, be a very intimate one. Thus, one discloses personal data to make an appointment, but by default, one loses one's right to confidentiality. What I would say is that we do ask what the nature of the appointment is, often so we can then allocate you to the right person or the right length of appointment. Um, you're totally within your rights to say it's private, it's personal, I prefer not to say. I get that all the time. And then normally they're put in for a 20 minute appointment because that probably means something that we're gonna to need to discuss in detail. It's not just gonna be your toenail you're usually, but actually all the reception staff are bound by confidentiality as well. So although you've told that one person what the problem is, they can't then go and tell anyone else. That they'll just put it onto this doctor's screen so they know why you're booking the appointment. But then that is still confidential within the practice. Thanks. There's a, a question from Atul Kumar Berg. May I ask the panel's view of the legality under GDPR of the current plans to mass upload data? In particular, I wonder, A, if a patient gave me data in 1997 with consent for me to respond to record it for clinical care, is that consent valid for the secondary uses of GDPR? And B, uh, is assumed consent not a pretty fundamental breach of GDPR? Uh, and is there not a requirement for consent to be appropriately time limited? I don't know who's that. Maybe Terry? Is Terry there? Yeah, I'm just, um, in, in fact, I'll answer one of Rosie's questions actually as well. Oh, good. <laughs> the, 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 one of the things to understand from a legal viewpoint is that the data actually belongs to the Secretary of State, all right? So you need consent from today, at the, today, as it stands today, not maybe tomorrow, but today, all of that data belongs to the Secretary of State. So if you get his permission to upload it and do whatever, then you have consent. However, coming back to GDPR rules, absolutely, you need the explicit consent of a patient going, perhaps going forward, if that information belongs to him. But the assumption at the moment from a legal viewpoint is that the data actually belongs to the Secretary of State. So it, 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 you, you as an individual don't really have control over it as it stands. If you have your uh, medical data on an app outside the NHS, then it is your data, and you as an individual have to give that consent. So anything anything within the NHS belongs, uh, any information of any sort in the NHS belongs to the Secretary of State? Yes, no, not the hospitals, not the doctors, not the practices, but the Secretary of State. So in actual fact, then it looks a bit like this is a bit of a farce, actually, saying that people can opt out because the well, Secretary of State could just overrule that. He could do, absolutely. But they're trying to be kind, aren't they? They're trying to do the right thing um, because there's been a number of legal cases where, um, so it, it's not in statute, but there are a number of legal cases which says, you know, patients should have access to their data uh, and be able to see it and be informed. But I will go back to this individual point. The actual data doesn't belong to them. Goodness. There's a question from Roberta Giloff. Hi, Roberta. I haven't seen you for a long time. Anyway, from Roberta, it's clear that, this, that it is GMC advice that confidentiality and consent uh, about 
that is essential. By GP's mass upload of data without specific consent, would the only one responsible legally, would the only one responsible legally if a patient sues for data shared without his consent? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading it as it is. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand that. Uh, so I, I think what we're trying to say is who would be responsible if a patient wanted to sue for unlawful upload? No. Yes. And I said earlier, my worry would be that the GP practice would be responsible, but now Terry has said that that data is owned by the Secretary of State. It makes me think, well, the patient can't sue because it's not theirs to start with. Well, then the Secretary of State could sue you. If you didn't upload it. data, if you hadn't asked him. Or, or, or the patient can sue the Secretary of State. I mean, you yes. know, you, you, you can get a debate, you can get a legal debate going as to who actually does it belong to. And, 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 and maybe, by the way, that might be the way that it happens. So, I mean, there is a legal so, case going on at the moment, isn't there, about this? So there's potentially, yeah. So we did a letter of intent um, to try and get the government to tell us more about this because there was so little detail available. It was just third party companies may have access under possible circumstances, but we're not going to tell you what they are and when and who and why. Um, so there was that sort of change. Um, then the government brought in this pause and said they wanted to engage in a trusted, to create a trust, trusted research environment. Um, and then nothing's happened. And they haven't responded to any of our letters. They haven't sent us anything we've asked for. So the legal case, we are funding again for it, we're crowdfunding for it with Fox Club and the other people in the coalition. Um, so watch this space, legal letters may be going out. That's interesting. Roberta makes a point that uh, the data property is one thing, but uh, he says access to it should only be allowed by the patient. So it's not just, it's not the ownership uh, of data, but it's access to the data. Is, does that ring true to you, Terry? Um, <laughs> well, the, the, the patient obviously has, act, has legal access to his own data. And, and that's, I, I can't remember, I think it's Montgomery or some, versus a state or something up in Scotland um, that, that gave the rights of the patient to access that data. Um, but I will still go back to this point, the, 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 the right who actually has it is, is the Secretary of State. So therefore he can decide basically where it goes. You still got to have access to it. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Um, but the fact it might be sitting in, uh, in, in the US of A and you have access for it, well, you still have access for it, but you still don't have ownership of it of the previous data i'm not sure what it will be going forward but 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 certainly that would be the situation you'd still have access for it goodness uh, and, 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 but, carry on, and, and carry by on. the way if the secretary of state gives access to somebody else and they decide legally then so long as the patient's got access you, you're not denying other people rightly or wrongly and by the way, I do think for research, it's a good thing. So, so I mean, it, uh, the, the real difficulty about this is that we really want this data available for research. I mean, it's absolutely critically important for research. And it seems so unfortunate we've got into this situation where uh, we are potentially creating a problem for access for very good, important research reasons, because the potential for misuse by other groups. And uh, it seems that there must be some way around this. So if I could just come in here, um, I think one of the things that is being proposed uh, moving forward is the way that data is accessed, say for research 
might change. So instead of a, a load of data being sent to somebody after the, the approval processes and so on, that researchers um, would work the other way around. So they would take their analytics and their code and run it on data that is, is held somewhere. So this is this term, trusted research environments. Um, and that could uh, provide a more, more security um, because the data isn't then in a place, um, in multiple places and you know, there's then less control over it. So um, I think there's a, a lot of emphasis going on at the moment about switching some of this round. And I think that we can see going forward that that's more likely to be the way of, of working. Well, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Does, is that going to need a lot of investment to be able to control it? Well, there is. there has been quite a lot of investment in those kind of environments. So there's a programme called Health Data Research UK that um, is funded from um, some government departments and other organisations, Medical Research Council, Wellcome Foundation, I think. Um, and, and they are establishing a number of these environments where data for particular purposes. So there's one particularly focusing on cardiovascular disease. Um, there are others focusing on, on, on other aspects of care. Um, and, and, and so there is there are prototypes that are um, that have been set up um, that work in that way. So I think there's some good examples and some rapid development in that area in the, in the last 18 months or so. Well, I think it's actually quite good to end this web webinar on a positive note is that there is a potential way forward because we really need a positive way forward rather than just all recoiling and say, you know, we want to withdraw all of our permissions because that would just be really terrible if it actually happened. Um, anyway, so, can I just ask one very yeah, quick? Of course. Mary. So this debate has highlighted the pros and cons. We need our data anonymized properly, but Terry has said that there's no true method to do that because they can mix several data sets, anonymized data sets, and get a profile of the person. Uh, but we need our data to help medical research, and in turn, that'll help us and our, our children. Um, but I, I think, as personally, I would like to know where my data is and who is accessing my data in the future. So I want my data to be used by good groups. Um, but then if an insurance company, for instance, tries to access my data, I'd like to know that. If Tesco tries to access my data, I'd like to know that. So the question is, Terry, with blockchain, uh, where we can, with ledgers, we can see, and we're transparent with all the data, we can see along the, the information highway Who's access, who wants to access our data and who we give permission to access that data? Can blockchain be the answer? It, it certainly is one of the technical things that, you, that can be applied um, without knowing the technical environment that they're, that they're setting up. Um, you, you can't answer that in, in absolute terms. But yeah, sure, that's a, a, a technique, if you like, a technology that could be used. Um, but then this goes back to also a, a debate. I mean, I have an 88-year-old uh, father-in-law who, who is not in the slightest interested in data or even, even a phone. Um, so, you know, these things need to be available to everybody um, and, and not just a select few. Um, however, that select few may be, may be chosen. Okay, Probably well, not the answer you wanted, but, 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 but it's a, a novel. Well, well, listen, I'd just like to thank every single one of you, Stafford for hosting it, Rosie, Sarah and Terry. Terry, I don't think you're 100% right. The notes are the property of the Secretary of State. That doesn't mean the data is. And that's, that applies to... <clears throat> so in private practice, and I'm a private doctor, the note, I'm the custodian of several other doctors' notes who've retired and I look after them. That doesn't give me the right to give the information on the notes to anybody. 
and, and, and I think, Rosie, that's something that you and Sarah need to discuss in the future because it, it confused me a bit. Yeah, the notes are the property of the Secretary of State. That doesn't mean anybody can do anything without permission. And that's where Roberto's point is right. Um, and, and, you know, other points we've had as well, which is when you ring up your GP for an appointment and the receptionist says, what's it about? Well, that could be regarded as a potential data breach, isn't it? Isn't it? Especially in a small community. So I think we've discussed a hell of a lot tonight. And I'm very grateful for Sarah and Rosie, Terry, um, for, for, for giving us a, a fabulous discussion, which has left us a lot to think about. You know, for me, the saddest thing about this is the data is going one way. And, and Rosie raised that earlier on. It's not coming back to us. So the technology from the AI companies that are going to be using are in our way, their ways of assessing our interventions in healthcare won't be a benefit to the people who it's based on. And I think that's terribly wrong myself. I don't know what you guys believe, but uh, I think it is, um, especially with skeptics in medicine, you know, um, what they do in Iceland and what they do in Sweden, they haven't sold to America. They've kept it. What they've done in Iceland is remarkable with their gene tech pool, which has been for the benefit of the country. And in Sweden, everybody's got a universal number, which is used to assess the interventions that, that have worked quite well. Anyway, enough of me. I'm not a speaker on it. I just very much enjoyed listening to all of you. Um, I'd like to thank Claire for hosting it tonight on behalf of IPS and Robert from IPS, who's our business partner. Um, also, I'd like to tell you about next month, so we might not be in lockdown by the by the time we have this webinar. Definitely the football will be over. Um, and we've got Peter Barnes from the Brompton um, with his colleagues Richard Russell and Mona Buffadil. And they're doing a, a webinar on inhaled steroids in the management of early COVID-19. Let's hope we won't be going on and on with different issues around how to, to, to work on that. But one of the interesting things from the paper uh, is that it was the non-asthmatics who benefited the most from steroids. So Rosa, you as a GP, Sarah, you at the Nuffield, and Terry, you as maybe a non-asthmatic who might be worried about your health because you live in Spain, you might want to get an inhaler. Stafford, thank you very much for tonight. St uh, Sanjeev, it was lovely seeing you. Um, thank you all for joining us. Our next webinar is on the 29th. Now, just a small housekeeping detail. Claire will be sending you a link to a paper from Imperial about data. And it, it, it's a very useful paper to read after the discussion we've had tonight. Um, hopefully you'll join us on the 20, 29th of July um, with Peter Barnes. Um, so good night. Thank you for joining us. Have a very good rest of your week. Bye. Thanks so much.